So, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Oxford Nanapur for inviting me to speak here today. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm delighted to meet all those people that I've gotten to know quite well in the MAP community over the past uh, year or so. And I'm also delighted to be in, in a speaker lineup full of uh, well-known and well-respected uh, members of the sequencing community. Uh, Ewan Burney, uh, I was at a meeting with Ewan this morning and he asked everyone to introduce themselves and uh, he said, can you tell the group whether you're wet or dry? Um, I thought this was a rather personal question uh, until I realized he was talking about uh, whether you work in the lab or whether you're computer based. So um, I said, I I'm, I'm very wet. So um, having said that, until last year, I actually never ran a next generation sequencing experiment, never analyzed any NGS data, or uh, n never made a library. So I think that really illustrates the, uh, the, the power of the technology. You know, I, I got my hands on this device a year ago and I'm already applying it uh, t t usefully in, in, in for biological uh, applications. Um, so um, I'd like to talk to you today about what I want to do with the MinION. And that really is to, uh, to, to, to introduce it into infectious diseases diagnostics and to try and push um, clinical microbiology uh, uh, into the 21st century. Um, and so I'm going to talk about nanopart sequencing and is it disruptive technology in, in, in clinical microbiology. So overview of the talk is uh, current problems with diagnostics and antibiotic prescribing. What are the issues? Uh, the role of rapid diagnostics, what, what, what can it do? Uh, advancing sequencing technology, wh where is it going and wh what do we need for sequencing technology to be able to make an impact in this area? Uh, sepsis, which is an area I'm very interested in. Um, pathogen DNA enrichment strategies, which is key to this area for me. And then a, a little bit about urinary tract infections as well. So. Um, as some of you will know, culture remains the gold standard for the diagnosis of infection. Um, and it's century old technology. Uh, you know, you grow the organism on a plate. That takes about a day. Uh, you identify it. These days, that doesn't take too long. And then you do an antimicrobial resistance test and see what antibiotics will work on it. Uh, that takes about a day. So um, in the meantime, if you're ill in hospital, you'll be treated with empirical uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. And uh, that's, that's not really ideal for a number of reasons I'll discuss in a while. But it's effectively educated guesswork. The clinicians decide based on what the likely pathogen is and, and what the local resistance rates are. So, um, what can rapid diagnostics do in this area? Well, um, I've been working in the area of rapid diagnostics for, for, for a number of years now. And, I've, been, I've developed many PCR-based tests, but the problem with PCR is that it's not comprehensive. You can only really detect what you're looking for. So you design primers and probes for various um, organisms and resistance genes, and then you try and multiplex all those. And the problem is you don't have the multiplexability to, co to cover everything you need. So PCR is not comprehensive. <laughs> Next generation sequencing shows great potential in this area because it can be fully comprehensive. It can detect everything. Resistance genes, pathogens, unknown or known. Right, so um, and what can it do? Well, it can improve antibiotic prescribing. Uh, it can enable the, the development of new narrow spectrum antibiotics. And that's because if you can detect what's in a patient sample quickly, then you can use a narrow spectrum antibiotics, but you can also develop a narrow spectrum antibiotic and you can do a clinical trial. And this will all lead to uh, personalized medicine in the future. Okay, everyone here knows what way uh, sequencing technology is moving. I've stolen this slide from some SA pathology from just Googled it. And so obviously everything's moving uh, from you know, low throughput to high throughput, smaller machines apart from this big one here. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, but it's not really there yet for molecular diagnostics. Uh, price coming down, everyone's seen this slide. Uh, so um, yeah, you know, we're nearly there. So what about the minion, or the minion, as a lot of people mispronounce it? There's a minion. There's two minions. So, uh, and uh, these are my minions, and this is what I use in the lab. So 
this is the technology, this is the new technology, this is why we're all here. Okay, so everyone knows it costs about $1,000, 512 pores. With our shearing in, in a G-tube, we get around 6.5 KB reads on average, and we can generate up to two gigs, uh, which has recently been demonstrated by this person here. Uh, and there, <laughs> that's the only reason that's up there. <laughs> Uh, so, but I think the reason I really did put this up there is because it shows you how this is advancing. This is the league table of most yield, and what you can see is that everything's April, March or April. So all these high yields are coming lately, so the, the technology is improving rapidly. It can detect pathogen and ID in minutes. Uh, as soon as the first reads come onto the, uh, your, your, your PC, you can, you can pretty much tell what the pathogen is. Can it detect resistance genes? Yes, it can, just takes a little bit longer. Okay, so we published the first uh, paper on the application of, of, of MinION, certainly in clinical microbiology. And, you know, this, when, when I look back at this paper, it seems really old and out of date already. It was only officially published about two months ago. So um, you can see this is the data that we were getting for that paper. You know, we were getting 79 in strands. Uh, uh, lots of pores not active. Um, you know, we had maybe 90 megabases of, of, of raw sequence event, event data for that for that uh, paper. And then uh, just before Christmas, you know, things started to look up, and we started. This was the first really good flow cell I ever got, and it was you know it was uh, producing you know at a 300 in strand at any one time, and it produced I think um, 600 megabases of sequence, and that was really really nice to see, and it was really encouraging. And then uh, even more recently, uh, you know, we're starting to see, and this is a picture of the, uh, the two gig run that I got. This is, it's, uh, I think, after, 20, after the 24 hour channel change, and you can still see there's 430 active pores there, and it was chugging along nicely. So, you know, and that's, and that's a distribution of the reads, and it really, really looked great. And, and that's just recently. Obviously, I've had some uh, poor runs in the middle of all that, plenty of them. But the technology is definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, that particular run, the last one I've shown, is E. coli K12. You know, we got 300 megabases of 2D, uh, 45,000 2D reads, uh, the same uh, average length, and, and greater than 60x coverage. Um, so why? So now the technology is getting there. It's nearly ready. This type of technology is exactly what I need for clinical. Uh, microbiology, using NGS in clinical microbiology. What do I want to apply it to? Well, sepsis. Okay, so sepsis is in, uh, a systemic inflammatory response caused by infection. Uh, mortality rates are really high, 40 to 80 percent in um, cases of septic shock. Uh, so there's about 200,000 deaths per annum uh, in Europe alone, ab about the same in the U.S., uh, mortality increases with every hour's delay in effective antimicrobial therapy. Now that is very important because you can see that here, and this is a very famous uh, graph that was produced by Kumar et al. Uh, in, in critical care medicine. And what it shows is that if you're very ill with sepsis in hospital and you don't get the right antibiotic, every hour you don't get it, your chance of survival decreases drastically until after 24 hours you're pretty much dead, okay? So this is why we need rapid diagnostics. So what do they do in the meantime? Well, they give broad spectrum antibiotics. So, and it's, uh, so, so obviously, they give very strong broad spectrum antibiotics that are designed to cover as many pathogens as possible. And lots of patients don't need those really strong antibiotics. So they're over-treated, and that's wasteful, and it causes resistance. Some are undertreated. It's the wrong um, treatment for the particular pathogen that they have. So this all leads to poor antibiotic stewardship, and is, that's a big thing in the area of antimicrobial resistance at the moment, and a problem with no new drugs coming. So microbiological culture, what does that do? Well, uh, it's less than 60% sensitive, and because there's low pathogen numbers in, 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 in um, the blood, and maybe only one to 10 in a septic patient per mil of blood. Uh, and because patients are often treated before a sample is taken, culture is very poor. So there's also complex etiology, and the complex etiology of this disease makes it very difficult for PCR to, to be able to diagnose. 
So that's why next generation sequencing is particularly applicable in this, in this case. So NGS has great potential because it can detect bacterial, viral, fungal, viable but non-culturable, and dead pathogens. It's rapid compared to culture. Uh, you can detect antibiotic resistance markers, and it will, as I mentioned, enable stratified antibiotic treatment using narrow spectrum agents. And these are easier to, to develop for, for, for those involved in antimicrobial uh, development. What's the major challenge? Why isn't everyone doing this already? Well, because if you take a mill of blood, there's a huge amount of human DNA in that mill of blood and very few pathogens. So the ratio is approximately 10 billion to one uh, human to bacterial DNA in a septic blood sample. Okay, so what do we got to do? We have to try to enrich for the pathogen DNA and uh, remove the human. Okay, so I won't go into too much detail about how we're doing that, but um, we're developing strategies, and, and our current strategy is that we remove the leukocytes, uh, and then we uh, lyse the remaining leukocytes, get rid of the human DNA, and then sequence what's remaining. So we're achieving about 99.9995% removal of the human DNA using this approach. Uh, so that's at least 30 micrograms of human DNA we're removing from a mill of blood. The bacterial component of the sample remains relatively unchanged. We can do this procedure in about an hour and a half, and we're currently testing this on septic blood samples. Okay, so we've, we've a, we're currently running a prospective study and a retrospective study. So numbers are very small, early days yet, but what we're doing is we have seven blood samples from patients with suspected sepsis that are being collected prospectively in the local hospital in Norwich. So one of those patients so far has been positive by blood culture and positive by our method, and we detected streptococcus pyogens. That was the correct pathogen. The second set of samples, we've only tested two. Six more we're, we're, we're currently testing. One has been positive by both culture and minion, and we detected Enterococcus faecalis in that particular sample. So I'll just explain that in a little bit more detail. So, okay, this is a, bit, a little bit busy, but um, effectively, when we take a sample here, a blood sample, and we spike it with um, strep pneumoniae, and we don't do any enrichment, and we sequence it using Illumina, we get plenty of Illumina reads two of them being strep pneumonia, and that was quite a high um, um, amount of uh, strep pneumonia that we added into, the, that we spiked into that sample. So we need enrichment, we've, we've proven that. Um, if you take real samples here, and you do enrichment, and I can show the level of enrichment here because these are CTs for human DNA, and we see that they're low there and that they're higher here, and that means we've gotten rid of plenty of human DNA. Now we see that the Illumina reads, when we, when we try to do Illumina sequencing, and that we get very few Illumina reads, and that's because we've removed all the DNA and we have nothing to amplify. We have nothing to sequence. So we need to actually do whole genome amplification on these samples to get this to work. So then when we did whole genome amplification on these samples, we can see here, this is where we've removed the human DNA. This is the Illumina reads before we did uh, whole genome amplification and this are the Illumina reads after. We've only tested one of these samples because the rest were negative by PCR, so we didn't bother to test them. So this one here is the one we tested. So we got 11 million Illumina reads and 21,000 strep pyogens uh, reads, which is 0.2% of the total. So that means that we went from about 10 billion to one ratio of human to bacterial down to about 500 to one. And we got around 30% of the strep pyogen's genome there, and uh, that was very informative for us in that case, right? Actually, in this particular case, the blood culture for that particular blood sample was negative. One that was taken eight hours previously was positive, and it was positive for strep pyogen's. We got the isolate for that. We sequenced it using Illumina, Actually, they did that at, at Public Health England, I should say. And, uh, and that uh, matched our isolate, which shows the power of this technology to detect uh, dead cells as well in, in, in blood. Okay, so 
the more interesting stuff, moving away from Illumina sequencing, which, which all took far too long. Um, we've moved now in our, in, in our retrospective study to, to, to look at frozen blood samples with min-ion sequencing. So what we find here is that we get good enrichment. We remove all the human DNA. Our 16S PCR just tells us a lightly positive or negative. We don't rely on this, but it gives us an idea if there's any bacterial DNA present. So we sequence this particular sample. And this time, we got 30% of the reads were bacterial. So we've drastically improved our, our, our um, ratio of human to bacterial. And we make it feasible to use next gen generation sequencing, min-ion sequencing, to, to, to detect a pathogen in blood in a clinically relevant time frame. We can do all this in about eight hours at the moment, uh, pushing it. But um, so we detected Staphylococcus hemolyticus as well about 5% of the, the reads. And that is something that can be considered a contaminant or it can be an issue. Uh, it can be causing disease. We also detected the ERM B gene, which uh, suggests macrolide resistance. So then when we compared these results, and we had all the results from these particular samples, because this is a retrospective study, we looked at a, an alternative uh, PCR-based uh, commercial test for the diagnosis of sepsis. And we find that their test found Enterococcus faecalis with coagulase negative staph. Exactly what we found, except we found more detail. So our test is better than this test, better than PCR. We also found resistance genes, better than PCR. Blood culture found Enterococcus faecalis. And then after they did their antimicrobial uh, susceptibility testing, erythromycin resistance, so macrolide resistance, exactly what we found. So this demonstrates the potential of this approach to cl clinical um, diagnostics. So, you know, this represents the first, in, as far as I'm aware, the first non-targeted uh, next-gen sequencing-based diagnosis of infection. And um, so what we're seeing here is we can, in the future, uh, and by the way, this was a very poor min-ion run. If, if we just need to repeat this, and, and we can easily get full coverage of that bacterial genome. OK, so just to give you a little bit about um, enrichment um, in urine. Uh, so we did, this is early data again. And, and, and because it's early data, the coverage of the genomes is poor. But if you look on the uh, left, you see that um, we have a, 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 ge a genome uh, sequence from urine uh, without enrichment. And on the right is a genome sequenced with enrichment using nanopore. And what you find is that 6% of, of the reads are bacterial if you don't do enrichment. 70% of the reads are bacterial if you do do enrichment. So enrichment's important so that we don't waste our sequencing power on sequencing um, uh, host, uh, host DNA. And, uh, and, and I think it's, 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 a, it's a fairly straightforward thing that can be done before you go on to, on to uh, uh, use your nanopore sequencing. Um, so in, in a little bit more detail, this is, this is a more recent set of data. And this is just looking at resistance genes um, that we detect using uh, min ion uh, sequencing directly from a real uh, clinical uh, urine sample. So you know, we got, we got plenty of 2D reads, 12,000, uh, decent coverage, 10x, um, very few human reads, 124. Um, and uh, these are the resistance genes that we detected. And this is the culture result. And they match very well. And that's the take-home message here. Even though we've gotten quite a number of TEM genes because uh, we didn't actually get a min-ion consensus before we looked at this, it doesn't matter. It's telling us that there's you know, likely ESBL uh, and there was. Um, we can also tell you know, that there's trimethoprim resistance by detecting this acquired gene. Uh, some of the genes detected are, are, are um, chromosomal genes, and you would need uh, better uh, depth uh, possibly to, to, to look for mutations in those genes to see if there's any resistance determining mutations in those particular genes. Um, but it all looks quite promising. And uh, this, is, this is really where we're going with this technology now. So in summary, um, NGS-based diagnostics has become feasible. And, and min-ion technology really is key to that. Uh, I, I 
would equate it to possibly the difference between conventional PCR and real-time PCR. And until real-time PCR was developed, you know, uh, PCR never really took off as a diagnostic to be used routinely. Now I think this type of diagnostic technology, real-time sequencing, will make it possible to, to use this technology in clinical microbiology. So you can get pathogen ID in minutes. Uh, you can get reliable resistance marker detection in around four hours. We reckon you need around 10x coverage to get good, good resistance marker detection. In fast mode, that could be a lot, lot quicker. Um, long reads are uh, very useful for determining the origin of chromosomal resistance genes in mixed samples. You know, in that, in that example I showed where we have um, uh, coagulase negative staph and um, enterococcus, it's good to know, it's good to have these long reads so we can pick out uh, which chromosomal genes, uh, resistance genes belong to which organism. Um, and it, it, it'd be useful, very useful for, for de novo assembly for epidemiology purposes. Uh, so sample preparation is the bottleneck, and, and, and that's what we're trying to address. Um, so, and we're developing a novel minion-based uh, workflows for sepsis and UTI diagnostics, and we intend to move into respiratory tract infections in the near future. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, some people, and we're working with uh, Dr. Nick Lohman, I think you might know him, uh, Jim Huggett, somebody from LGC in London, Lisa Crossman, who's also here and will be talking tomorrow, Solomon, who's done a huge amount of this work, um, he's my PhD student, and uh, I work closely with Professor John Wayne and David Livermore up at UEA also. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. I am a pathologist uh, from Singapore. Just wondering, uh, do you face any challenges in terms of the computation uh, aspect, uh, trying to uh, map the pathogen and identify the pathogen? Um, I think, well, I do personally, yes, because I'm, I'm not very good at bioinformatics. But yeah, I think uh, with the kind of technology that people are developing, where you do real-time analysis of what comes off, um, the device uh, like Minotaur uh, from Matt Luce, that this can be done in real time without the use of a bioinformatician, without anybody analyzing the data, that you can automatically look for the sequences that you're interested in, in our case, um, uh, pathogens and resistance genes, and that this can be done on the fly, shall we say, as you go. So we, uh, Lisa Crossman does a lot of our bioinformatics analysis and has developed pipelines that are quite rapid now, but I would foresee this happening you know, on the fly, rapidly, as the sequencing is, is running. Thank you. So, hi. So, um, so how, how do you do the enrichment, please? Um, if you can comment on this. <laughs> um, so and num yeah, sorry, and, and number two, if, if, if I may, uh, you remind me of the NIP test, which is the non-invasive prenatal uh, diagnosis test, where we detect the fetal uh, DNA yeah. from the mother, and we can compare it uh, using SNPs, basically, and separate them bioinformatically rather than, than do and, and whether you use such tubes as cell-free to stabilize the DNA, at least of the, from the white blood cells. Is that a possible? So when you take a, when you take a blood sample, yeah. do you use any uh, stabilizing agent for the white blood cells? I think you need, well, you no, might need to think Well, I don't, I, yeah, yeah. Why, why would I want to stabilize the white blood cells? Because you don't want the DNA from the white blood cells. Well, yeah, I remove you, you, them. You, want, I, you I, want to remove them. Yeah, so I, I, do, I take two approaches to removing them. One is to, one is to, to capture them and remove some of them. But I, effectively, I don't think that's the best way to do this because in some ways I'd like to um, look for intracellular pathogens, so I wouldn't like to remove all the, all the white blood cells. So I don't mind if some of them are lysing and some of them are around. So the other approach is to, to actively lyse them and digest the DNA, but do not lyse the bacteria at the same time. So you do differential lysis. So, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Roger Meisel, uh, Norway. What about viruses? 
Uh, are your uh, met enrichment methods um, based on only bacterial enrichment or are you also looking for viruses? Yeah, bacteria and fungi with the approach that I've showed, but what we would do for viruses is to take a, a portion of plasma and, and extract uh, DNA from, or RNA, total nucleic acid from that, and then put that in with our total nucleic acid uh, uh, that we extracted from the, from, the, from the whole blood, mix that together, then whole genome amplify, and then sequence everything. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.